Neil, welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction, Yasna, and welcome everybody. I'm um, delighted to be here and um, to get the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, this presentation has allowed me to organise uh, some thoughts that I've been having around this topic of how to cope, I guess, and how to manage as a, as a communication professional when um, working in organisations that don't necessarily practice or want to practice communication by the book. Um, so I'm really grateful to get this opportunity again to, to present to you today and share some of the experiences I've had over the past um, decade or so working in, uh, in communications. Um, I can't see myself, so if I'm pulling all sorts of faces, I do apologise, but I, um, I don't see myself. I just see the presentation um, and probably recommend that you focus on that too. Um, what I'd like you to do, though, uh, to begin with, is to close your eyes um, and just imagine the scenario that I'm going to describe to you. I want you to picture yourself um, making your way into the office. Um, even if you have one or you don't, you're, you're getting into the elevator and you bump into some of your colleagues from finance and legal, um, one of whom taps you on the shoulder uh, and, and says, congratulations, by the way, on that, um, that announcement last week. I thought it went really well. Um, so you're feeling very good about that. You get out of the elevator and you go to um, your desk and settle in. Um, you have an email waiting for you from the CEO who has invited you to go to their office. So you go, go along to their office and sit yourself down um, and they tell you that in six months time there's going to be a new product launch and you have two whole months um, in which to create um, a communication plan. Um, and just as you're leaving after that short discussion, the CEO calls you back and says, um, by the way, don't forget to include that section on measurement. Um, I really want to see how um, you're going to measure the success of your communication program that's, that's supporting this product launch. Now I want you to open your eyes and I just want you to think about whether or not that reflects your everyday and whether or not that's the kind of reality you're used to at work. And if it is, then this webinar might be useful for you, um, but this webinar really is for the people who are sat there thinking that that reality and that scenario is nothing like what they're used to. Because over the past 12 years or so that I've been working in professional communication, unfortunately I've noticed that um, that sort of dream scenario I just described is not really the reality that we face as communication professionals. And there's so much out there, I guess, um, that tells us how it should be done um, IEBC itself has um, a, a, a wealth of um, content and resources that support us in being able to be great communication professionals. Um, but often the organisations we work in um, don't share that vision of, of what communication should be like. A quick story for you, a few years ago um, I was brought into an organisation to help strengthen um, its internal communication function. Um, and I, uh, all throughout the interview process, was really impressed at how open they, uh, this organisation sounded to, to, to good communication. I was really excited about the new job. Um, and I got stuck in straight away to a, a project for, um, it was a global uh, campaign that needed to be um, created. And I did the usual thing. I sat with all of the senior stakeholders involved, um, mapped out all the audiences, did everything according to the book went back to the project team with um, the, the plan that I'd built um, and somebody sort of pulled me aside, quite a senior person, and, and sort of said to me, you know, Neil, we don't need to be patronised by, uh, by this, this sort of thing. We really just need you to tell us how to communicate. Which I guess was a bit of a surprise, um, considering everything that I'd um, sort of anticipated and had been led to believe. Um, and unfortunately, I've got other examples that I could share with you like that, but what that one showed me was no matter how much an organisation says that it, it wants good communication or is open to good communication, unfortunately, a lot of the time, um, they actually don't know what that really looks like. And, and when, when you, they start to see what that looks like, they can be quite put off. And that can be quite frustrating to, to people like you and I, you know, enthusiastic and maybe even talented communicators like we all are. And that can be quite frustrating. Um, but if, 
if I think back over the, the past 10 years or so of my work, I, I can say with, um, uh, with conviction that it is possible to thrive in, in those organisations that don't necessarily appreciate um, good communication. And the purpose of today really is to, to give some tools and techniques and share some of the experiences that I've had um, to avoid looking like this little guy um, and to actually help you thrive as a, as a professional communicator. So it's a one, two, one, two sort of a format. There's um, one big reveal, uh, a bit of a secret that I'm going to share with you. Um, I've got two promises, two pledges that I'd like you to take with me uh, today. Um, there's a principal recommendation that I'm going to make to you. And then I'm going to share two templates, the templates that Yasna said are available in the, uh, the handout screen. Um, and they're sort of practical tools that you can use to, to help um, you practice good communication no matter where you're working. Hopefully at the end we'll have some time for sort of some discussion or questions and answers um, because I don't pretend to have um, a magical solution here that's going to solve all of your problems but hopefully if we can discuss it then um, we, can, we can help. Um, I just thought I'd share with you my, my professional timeline here, just to give you the context of where I'm, I'm coming from with, with this presentation. Um, I got my start um, in languages. I graduated as a, um, a student of French and German, um, which, as an Englishman, um, being able to speak a language other than English is usually quite um, a, a differentiator, a bit of, a, of an advantage. Um, but unfortunately, I moved to Montreal where everybody spoke French um, and very few people needed to speak German. Um, so I was kind of faced with a, a situation where, um, or, or a, a sort of an ultimatum of whether or not everything that I'd just studied was going to get me anywhere. Um, thankfully, I was able to sort of survive and, and make it work by being able to speak French in Quebec. Um, and I got my first job in, in the nonprofit sector and spent a few years working in um, member and donor communications and, and special projects and it's really there and in those roles that I started to see the power of communication within organizations and on its stakeholders and I thought there was something in that so um, I decided to go back to school and, and enrolled in um, PR management uh, course at McGill University um, and that was really great because um, kind of like languages in a way um, there was something about the uh, PR process and the, the communication process that really just made sense um, and I just couldn't wait, couldn't wait to get um, into you know, communication specific roles and make a difference in organisations um, but unfortunately um, when I got into those communication specific roles I, I quickly realised that um, my peers and my colleagues in, in the different functions and the different parts of the organisations I was working in didn't necessarily share the enthusiasm that I had for um, strategic communication. Um, so I was kind of faced with another one of those choices of whether or not everything that I just studied was going to actually get me anywhere. Um, and I just decided that enough was enough and I, um, I really wanted to make this one work and, and I was going to go for this one. Um, and I really was going to apply the, the textbook approach that, that I'd learned at McGill um, and, and really apply that in my work, whether or not people were open to it. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, those sad faces that you see at the top of the screen, um, don't let that um, mislead you. Um, I have actually really enjoyed my work over the past 10 years or so. Um, it's just that really what I, I, I identified across those organisations was there was a, a lack of understanding, I guess, and an appreciation for um, the difference that communication can make in solving some of those big issues that organisations face. And that was the common thread that I saw across all of those roles, and that's really led to, to me building this presentation. Um, there's a few other things on here that you might have had a chance to look at, and that's with regards to volunteering and, and professional development. I'll come back to those at the end, but I, I did want to note those on this slide. So if it's been a bit doomy and gloomy, then how is it that I've managed to, to sort of be here and, and be in front of you today? Um, well, it's taken quite a lot of resilience, and I think that that's probably um, a key point to make, that working in an organisation, an environment that doesn't necessarily support communication in the way that you'd like it to be, um, it's really important that you remain resilient. Um, my experience has shown me that organisations that don't necessarily practice great communication are in fact open to it. They just need to be shown 
what good communication looks like. And if you're able to demonstrate the impact of good communication, I think that you'll be surprised at how open um, people can be to practicing communication like you would like it to be practiced. Um, and actually, as I was putting this presentation together, I kind of realized that I've been um, harboring a bit of a, a secret for, with it when, when working in these organizations. Um, without really realizing it, I was kind of making my mind up to just practice good communication anyway. You'll hear a lot about um, needing to get the input of your CEO and the buy-in, in fact, from your CEO into your communication work. And I would agree that that's really important. Um, and if you're lucky enough um, to have that buy-in and support, then, then that's great. Um, but when I was faced with a situation where they weren't particularly interested in, in the communication planning um, and the communication approach that I was taking, um, if they weren't interested in that, I didn't let that bother me too much. And in fact, I didn't get distracted by that and let that put me off um, doing great communication. So what ended up happening is that I was actually practicing communication that I knew to be the textbook approach, kind of in private and on my own. You know, sometimes my bosses didn't realize that I was building these communication plans behind the scenes and that the communication work that I was executing was based on these plans. Um, so that was actually quite revealing for me when I realized that was, that's what was happening. Um, and it kind of made me think that this is what we all need to be doing. Um, it's not necessarily getting distracted, like I say, about the, 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 whether or not the CEO and the executives that you're working for um, are buying in. Don't let that put you off and certainly don't let that stop you from doing it. Just do it anyway um, and just get on with practicing that communication because over time that will help you build your credibility in your organizations but it will also be good for the soul because you'll be know you'll know that you're practicing the communications that you um, you know to be the right way so that leads me to the first promise and the first pledge that i'd like us all to make um, as part of our commitment to being able to thrive as as communicators and that is simply just practice good communication no matter what and sometimes even if you have to do that in private now this works much better if we're all in a room together, so I'm just going to have to trust that you're doing it now. Um, but if we were in a room, I'd ask you to, to raise your hand and, and take the pledge with me to just practice good communication. Okay, I'll, I'll trust that you just took that uh, pledge with me and made that promise. So now that we're all on board and we're, we're committed to, to doing this and to practicing it no matter what the, the environment, um, this is my main recommendation around being able to do this um, um, in practice. And that is about being annoyingly consistent. Consistency for me as a communicator is really, really key. You need to be dependable and you need to be reliable. And there are four main areas where I think consistency is critical in what we do, um, both in terms of building the credibility of communication and your role as a communicator, but also just again in, in terms of looking after yourself and making sure that you're practicing the right communication for yourself. Um, the first point is around execution um, and you really have to be great at executing and great at tactical delivery and you can have the most elaborate and strategic plan behind your um, tactical delivery but if you fail on the execution um, it really lets you down so you really have to be able to execute every single time um, so that people really come to depend on the fact that you can deliver. This quote I think really sums it up well and this is taken from Fitzpatrick and Valskov's manual on an internal communication um, and it really um, speaks to me um, in, um, very clearly in the importance of being um, consistent in delivery because if we can't do it then people will um, will come to find other people who can, they can depend on more. Um, so it's really important that, that you nail execution. Somewhat related to that is um, about writing, and, and I know that that is um, part of execution, but it's worth a special mention in my opinion. Um, you need to be excellent at writing, and specifically taking people's ideas and being able to translate those into the right words um, as you're, you're building your communications tactics. I've had great experience and, and um, 
uh, great support from executives as well because of my ability to, to translate the ideas that they've got into the right kind of communications and definitely the right kind of words. So I would say really focus on excellent writing and you, you'll be surprised at how much support you'll get if, if people can count on your ability to write really well. Um, I also think that um, a relentless focus on audiences and outcomes um, is critical. These aren't in any order of importance, by the way. These are all as important as each other. Um, of course, your ability to write and your ability to execute depends on a focus on who it is that you're trying to reach and what it is that you're trying to achieve. And if you focus on this, you'll be surprised at how you build um, your support and momentum for the communication process because it's not about whether or not you think um, a website is right or a video is right. It's really focusing on the people who are going to be impacted by your communication and the, the nature of that impact as well. And if I go back to the, the story that I told you at the beginning, um, once I kind of brushed myself off a little bit and gotten over the shock of being um, labelled patronising, um, I, I explained to the team that really all that the, the communication plan that I was presenting to them was trying to achieve um, is focusing on the people that are being um, influenced and impacted by, by the, the communication project and what it is that we're trying to do. And in fact, the communication planning process is really aligning the project team around those um, views of success um, and making sure that the tactical delivery is, um, is based on um, the right kind of foundation. So I think you'll struggle to find um, an example of where people have um, disagreed with your recommendations when they're, when they're grounded in audiences and outcomes. So really focus on that as well. And then the last point is about measurement. Um, measurement for me is um, the critical piece and you cannot compromise on measurement. I never start a project um, or a communication process without insisting on um, what the measurement will be um, of success. Um, and it's really important that you do this too. It shows that you're not just interested in execution, you're interested in what happens as a result of the communication that you're about to do. Um, people around you might, and particularly in other functions, probably won't be insisting on this, um, but it's really important that you do. Um, the project that I was working on for ERM, where I work at now, um, we were launching a, a performance management system globally. And I spent a lot of time working with the project team when I was brought in to understand their view of success and then how communication could support that, um, that outcome. Um, and we spent a lot of time at the beginning of the project making sure that we knew how we would measure uh, the success of the program. Um, and in fact, the tactical delivery and the, the, you know, the execution of the actual communication program itself was so much easier because we were all on board with where we were going the approval circuit was much reduced because we were all aligned around this view of, of success and how we would measure it. So it really is um, a, a good idea. In fact, it's critical to focus on measurement at all times. Um, the thing that I would say about measurement is that it will always be difficult and there's no way around that. There's always going to be obstacles in your way, um, but don't, again, let that distract you and put you off doing measurement the way that it should be done. Um, you need to get creative. Some things that I've done in the past um, is get really good with sampling. So if I've been told that I can't email the whole company and to ask them to participate in a survey about the, the project, um, I've then um, asked if I can uh, send it to a representative sample um, of the organization and then get the, re um, the results uh, and, the, and, and get the, uh, the measurement that way. Um, I've also had some success in having a survey section on the intranet where you post surveys on different topics and different projects and people can go and participate of their own will. So not necessarily pushing that out there at people, but actually inviting people to participate voluntarily. So that's been quite successful. Um, and then anecdotal feedback as well. I always make sure that I'm capturing anecdotal feedback that I get from people talking about the project and, and talking about the communications that I've been working on because they're quite powerful. When people, particularly the executives, can see um, the, uh, the testimonials, if you will, the, um, the, the, 
um, the comments that you've received because of your communication. You know, I've, I've saved X amount of hours thanks to this new, new program and that sort of thing. It's really powerful. So make sure that you're capturing anecdotal feedback, even though it might not be necessarily scientific in terms of, um, in terms of measurement. It's really important. So I would say if you're, um, if you're thinking that you're, um, or you're working at the moment in an organization where um, they're not practicing great communication, you're having a hard time getting through. If you're consistent in these four areas, I think over time you really will build um, some momentum around what it is that you're doing. So that's kind of more principles though, I realize, and, and it was important to me that this would be a little bit of a practical session as well. Um, so I do want to share with you two templates that I use um, every day um, to help me uh, set myself up for, um, or to be able to practice uh, textbook communication. Um, the first one is really around uh, asking the right questions at the beginning of a project. Um, we're often brought into projects late in the game, um, and that can be frustrating, um, and it can be off-putting, but I, I don't let that stop me from um, getting the information I need to make an impact on the project. And it really is about asking the right questions at the beginning. Um, and I would urge you not to get too frustrated and distracted when you're not brought into, uh, into the project at the very beginning. Just ask the right questions at the beginning of your involvement um, and that will help a lot. So this first um, template that I use um, is really all about setting the scene and, and getting the background information that, that I need for a project. These are available to you, by the way, to download, so do that in the, in the handout section. Um, so this first one, um, I've evolved this over a number of years, but um, I took quite a lot of inspiration from um, a lady called Caroline Keeley, who's based in Canada. And there's a couple of links to Caroline's work on the left-hand side. Um, Caroline's a great thinker in terms of moving communicators from being tacticians to strategists. And, um, she insists as well on asking the right questions. So if you want more background on that, then, then um, go to that link. The other link on the right-hand side, by the way, is um, for any independent practitioners here, some, any consultants. Um, this is a, a bit of a, a tongue-in-cheek um, blog post about um, avoiding the wrong clients by asking the right questions. And I just thought that might be interesting for some of you. Um, but back to the template. So really, this is again, like I say, just about setting the scene um, and getting all the information that you need to make a difference for, uh, for the communication program. So the first couple of questions are about what it is that um, they, they're looking to do and, and achieve, where they stand in relation to that um, as of now, milestones and deadlines, all space for that kind of information here. The fourth question is about impact on the business. This one's a really important one, in my opinion. Um, it helps you prioritize the particular project in the context of everything else that you're working on and also in terms of what's going on in the business. So that can be quite helpful to you. Um, but also, in terms of positioning you as somebody who thinks more, about deli more than delivery, um, this is a really key question to ask because it shows that you care about where this fits into the overall picture for, for the business or the organization. So I always make sure that I have this kind of discussion as part of my initial involvement. Um, this also helps you to build your, um, your goals and objectives for the communication program. So, so this is a really key question. There's a, the next question is about success and how we know that we've, we've achieved success. Um, that's for the project itself. Um, because the next question is specific to the communication program. You know, you need to ask what people think the communication, the difference communication will make to success. I found over the years that um, communications can be blamed for the failure of projects when things don't go according to plan. And it's not always the case that communication is responsible. So what I like to do early on is have people think about what the view of success overall is for the project, and then think separately about how communication specifically can have an impact on that success. Um, again, it's just really helpful to, to separate out what the project is all about and what communication is specifically responsible for. So this to me is a, a key question to ask. Then there's space here to talk about the, the stakeholder groups, and it's worth noting um, the priorities of, uh, of stakeholder groups here. And then a space at the bottom to help you capture any other information. 
If you've got any questions about this and, and the approach, um, we can cover that at the end. Be sure to include your questions in the chat area. Hopefully that makes sense though, um, because um, what I do from here is um, I, I look at all of the information that I've, I've got together in here, and I do make sure that I've, I've got all the answers to all of these questions before I move on. Um, but I then move into um, this framework, um, which is the second template I'm sharing with you today. This is actually um, a, a document or a, a table that I've um, evolved over the years. It's based on um, an audience framework that the CIPR produced a few years ago, but I've evolved it um, over time to, to sort of um, to, to suit my own needs. Um, and this one is uh, is really great um, in terms of breaking down the audiences, focusing on outcomes, and then thinking about um, tactics and channels. Um, I found a lot of the time over the years um, is that people come to us with um, requests for things. So they would come to you and say something like, I need a poster for XYZ project, or we need to put out a video on ABC. Um, so they're starting on the right hand side of this, this column with the, the actual tactic. Working through this document with, on your own and also with others, what it does is that it focuses on audiences first, thinks about responses, and then gets into channels. So the idea is that we get people away from the right-hand side and start them off on the left-hand side. So the, the first box is where you note your audience. Um, the second one is for um, is space for you to think about what it is that you know of, about that particular audience in the context of the project. So. Here you would note things, you know, demographic information, um, you'd note things about whether perhaps they're, they're hostile or whether they're, they're friendly, um, whether they're connected to technology, if it's a dispersed audience, that sort of thing. So anything that you know about um, that audience in the context of the project. The third column takes that information and um, allows you to think about how that might impact the communication program. So, if they are hostile, maybe that means that the tone has to be considered. If they are not connected to technology, then perhaps here is where we would note um, this is where you know face-to-face -face communication might be more effective. So, how what we know about them is uh, influences communication. The space for you to note that here. The column that's highlighted um, allows you to note the responses that um, we need um, because uh, thanks to the communication program. And the way that I like to break that down is looking at knowledge, attitudes, and action. So know, think, and do. Um, chances are um, there will be something in all of these sections, but you'll end up most likely with a concentration of points in, in one of these um, areas. So that shows you then that the project is most likely for this audience about knowledge or action or attitude. Um, but that's a really good way of separating out the different things that you're looking to achieve um, and takes you to the space of focusing on outcomes as well. And then based on all of that information, the last, the last um, cell in the table is looking at channels. So if this audience, we know this about them and this is how it influences communication and this is our desired response, then this is the tactic that might um, help us achieve um, these these outcomes and these responses. So um, I've got one here that's completed. This is a, a fictional example. I've, I've just come up with this on my own. It's um, an imaginary acquisition. Um, I thought it would be useful just to, to leave this on the screen for a couple of minutes though to see how, how this works. So in the top row um, you've got the executive leaders um, They've been in the loop since the target phase, they know the context, they're engaged, they're geographically dispersed. So how that influences the communication program, well they don't need the details because they've already had a lot of it before. Um, In-person communications are difficult and so on. Um, we list the, the different um, responses that we're looking for thanks to communication, so they need to know what's happening and when, the strategy behind the acquisition, they need to deliver some of the messages, reinforce the purchase strategy. And based on all of that, these are the channels that might help us um, achieve these responses. Now, this particular template um, has really helped me over the years um, change the perception of the communication process within organizations. Most recently at ERM, I was working on an innovation tournament. 
Um, and after I completed that first um, sheet, uh, answer, getting answers to all of my questions, I plugged in the information that I had and built this, this framework for the Innovation Tournament project. I took that back to the senior partner that I was working with at ERM, um, and she was really surprised at, at I, I guess, the, the strategy behind um, the tactical delivery, because she wasn't used to um, working with anybody uh, from communications in this way. And in fact, she said that um, she quite enjoyed doing it because it made sense. You know, uh, it, it, there is a little bit of, a, I guess, a science to this process and a logic and a structure. So um, she found it um, really quite transformational in, in how she perceived the communication process. Um, so I would say that using this um, in public, if you're, you're able to, is, is also quite useful um, in changing that perception of communication. Um, so hopefully this makes sense. Um, from here, where I usually go is um, once I've validated the information that's included in this table, um, I would then go away and, and start building um, a traditional communication plan that you would probably um, recognize, one that has a goal, um, it has objectives, um, an audience analysis, key messages, and all of the, the usual things that you would see in a communication plan. But hopefully, um, what you'll see across those two templates that I've, I've um, shared with you today is a way in which to engage with um, people who aren't necessarily open to that traditional communication planning process. And, and it's an accessible way um, for you to start introducing how communication should be done. Um, and even if you don't show this to anybody, I hope that this is useful um, for you to, to still continue to work in private and use this um, in your own practice behind the scenes. So, um, a, a quick point that I would make as well, one of the things that I've had um, quite a bit of success with over the years is um, working with the wider communications team um, that I've been part of on an approach like this and, and sharing um, the approach so that everybody in the team is going out and working with business partners in the same way. That's really important. Um, and I think that um, if you do that, what, you, what happens over time is that you build a, a reputation for being reliable. Um, and as everybody's going out and, and working with the various parts of the organization in this way, um, you start to build an appreciation for um, the communication process. And, and, and it allows you to go out um, and practice those textbook communications. Um, but one thing that to be aware of though, or a few things actually, um, and it sort of goes back to what I was saying at the beginning of the presentation, um, that is that a lot of people don't know um, what they don't know about communication and it is up to us to, to show them. But it can be quite overwhelming for people as you go out into the organization and, um, and start, I guess, kind of, um, promoting this way of, of going about communication. Um, so it's really important that you, as you go out and you start um, working with people in this way, it's really important to keep it simple for them and try not to get too carried away with, um, with and, and too enthusiastic once you start to come out of the, uh, the communication closet, if you will, and start working with people more publicly. And the communication pro planning process I found can actually be quite exhausting for, for some people. So it is really important to keep it simple. Um, I have learned the hard way that um, taking too long to get to tactical delivery because I was spending um, hours and hours trying to build the perfect communication plan, um, that exhausts people. So do, do be, um, be aware of that and, and don't make the same mistake that I did. Um, because people, like I say, associate what we do with, um, with the, the tactics that we create. Um, so do keep it simple for people. And don't ever forget that communication speak um, can sound like a bit of a foreign language to people at times. Um, so don't get too carried away with that either. Um, and just for a bit of fun, I guess, but also um, to, to, as a bit of a warning as to the dangers of not keeping it simple. I've, I found um, a short video that I want to share with you. Um, and apart from it being um, fun and um, funny, uh, it is a, a, a bit of a, an illustration, I think, of the point that I'm trying to make. Because as we go out into our organizations and, and practice communication the way that we know it should be practiced, 
um, we can sound a bit foreign to people. So I just want to show you this clip. It's taken from um, the BBC programme 2012, which was a, um, a comedy show, a spoof basically, around um, the Olympic Organising Committee. Um, and this is the PR person, Siobhan Sharp, who um, it was a character on this, this programme. So I'm just going to hope that this works. Stop me if it doesn't. I think the legacy of the social media network that we are basically creating is going to far outreach the legacy of the games themselves. It's the kind of thing what we want people be to be doing is actually talking about the games, but also not talking about the games. I mean, the games is the beginning, but it's not necessarily the end or even the journey. Um, and I think the end is the thing that's going to be most exciting. And to promote the social side, the second screen of our um, kind of TV coverage, we've got various different um, apps, Misu, Get Glue, I Me, You me, um, Fastbox and Netface um, and all of those things are basically going to kind of be spread across our network. There's also a lot of other kind of um, sites that we kind of mashable sites, paid content, kind of have a cheeseburger. I mean those kinds of sites that we're appealing to, those are the people who use those, those are the kind of people who are going to be using our new site. Also um, a site that we're very um, interested in and as part of that idea of also regressing media because we feel that could also be the future, actually going backwards. Um, we're looking at MySpace um, that actually at the moment has the least amount of users and therefore it's the most exciting because it's the most fastest growing. I think it's important as well to acknowledge that um, sites like Twitter, um, it's where you get to express what you think about um, athletes. Um, you can comment on possibly what, how you think Jessica Ennis is looking, what she's wearing, um, because it's not all about the sport. Um, it's also about public opinion on athletes and all aspects of them. It's really exciting because we've got a great now relationship with Twitter. Um, we're developing all kinds of merchandise with them. Um, and as a result of the Olympic Games, um, you can now get 2012 Twivens, Twadges, Twee Shirts and Twandanas. Um, and these kinds of things are already like flying off the internet. I mean, my hope is that what we're actually starting, what we're creating in conjunction with all of these different digital um, and social networks is just to create something that actually means that in years to come people have forgotten the games you know and this is what they remember okay so that's unfortunately I think what sometimes people hear when we um, take a communication speak a bit too far so I, I do share that as a bit of fun but also as a a bit of a warning to um, always remember to, to keep it simple um, and in fact if ever anybody um, appears uh, to be anything like Siobhan Sharp um, then I think we've, we've really got problems for, for, for you and, and, and your credibility within the organisation so that brings me to my second promise um, that I'd like you to take with me um, and that is quite simply don't be Siobhan um, and remember to keep it simple for people and, and not get too carried away, um, especially when people start to get on board with, um, with practicing textbook communication. So second promise of the day, I will not be Siobhan. Okay, super. And the link is there if you ever wanted to watch that again. Um, so before we, we close for um, questions and, and discussion, um, just a couple of quick points really. As I was thinking about um, you know, how I've um, managed to thrive, I guess, um, over the past 10 years or so. It, it struck me that it hasn't always happened at work. Um, there's a, a few things that I've done um, over the past 10 years or so that um, have made a big difference to me and my ability to, um, to, to thrive um, that haven't happened at work. So the first one is around um, professional development and professionalization, I guess you could call it. Um, I hold the accredited business communicator and chartered PR practitioner designations um, and I did that for a number of reasons but I guess notably um, when I was working in organizations or have been working in organizations where they didn't quite get communication and I couldn't always practice um, as I would have liked to, pursuing those um, uh, professional designations um, showed me and proved to me myself that um, I was able to practice according to given standards um, and so that was actually quite important to me because um, it just gave me, gave me that encouragement and motivation 
um, that I was able to do it and, and, I, and, I, and I could um, sort of meet those standards. So that might work for you, it might not, but um, it's certainly something to consider as well. Um, and then secondly, I would say um, volunteering and, and professional opportunities in the volunteer space um, also provide um, a vast amount of opportunities for um, for you to practice um, what it is that you do to the, the way that you want it to be done. Um, there are countless organisations who would be delighted to have your your skills and support, um, and would provide you great opportunities to to sort of spread your communicator wings, if you will. Um, so in, in my case, I've done a lot of work within IEBC, but it doesn't have to be within the profession. It can be um, any kind of um, non-profit organization that um, would benefit from your skills. So, so do think about those opportunities as well. And um, don't necessarily just think of being able to practice um, your, your professional communication at, at the office. Um, so think about those things too, because they've, they've helped me a lot. Um, and with that, uh, Yasna, I would open for questions and discussion. Wonderful. Thank you, Neil, very much. It was very informative and very useful. And I can, I can testify that uh, the templates are very useful because I've heard you already speak about that in uh, New Orleans at the World Conference. Um, right now, we don't have any questions. Um, please uh, write them down in the chat pane. Um, but before we do, I have a question um, coming from an agency side. Um, when you talk about the first, the first template, the questions that you need to ask, uh, did you ever have uh, an experience where um, the potential client uh, didn't have the answers and you, you wanted the project, you wanted the job, but you knew that you know, in, in the beginning that there wasn't probably a good understanding uh, about what communications can do and what it cannot? Yeah, I, I, that's a really good one actually. And the uh, blog post that I, I linked um, on the on the slide with the template, um, that's very much the, um, the the orientation of that blog post because um, asking those questions is a really good way of um, ringing those alarm bells. Um, and it could be that um, you identify that um, they they don't have the answers to those questions, which really doesn't set you up for success um, for the communication program. Um, that doesn't have to be the end of it though, um, because what that provides is an opportunity to then discuss that in a bit more detail. It's possible that you know, with a bit more discussion and with asking the right kind of questions, um, they, they do have the answer, it just wasn't obvious straight away. Um, but, it, but it does show you where the, um, the gaps are um, in, in the project. Um, you know, it, if I think about some of the, the projects I've worked on in the past and asking these questions, I've actually been able to identify some pretty serious flaws um, in, in projects and, and actually they've realised that they weren't ready to go public with, um, with the launch of, of, of um, a, a new IT system or, or whatever it is. I'm, I'm trying to think of a specific example, but I know that, you know, because I've made that contribution and I've been asking the right questions, um, I've actually been able to help prevent um, prevent failure, I guess, um, all, in all senses of the communication program, but also for the wider project. Yeah, in my experience, um, it, it was a little bit better if you talk about it in, in the beginning, because then you uh, set up realistic expectations and uh, you even talk about it because usually, well not usually, but sometimes clients uh, don't really know what to expect. They, they would mm -hmm. like to work with you, but uh, their expectations might be a little bit uh, different than what you really can deliver. So um, I think it's a great idea to talk, to talk about it in the beginning. Very beginning. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do think that um, over time as well, it, it, it helps you with your own positioning. So within an organization or, or in the eyes of clients, because you know they, they see you as somebody that, that is asking the right questions, that does want the information yeah. that's going to make a difference. So I, I think it's really important. I just wrote in the in the chat pane again uh, if there are any questions, um, because if not, we're going to thank Neil for your time uh, and energy that you that you spent on IBC and um, 
uh, as an IBC board member, but also a really long time member, I can testify that uh, it is an association that uh, uh, when you give a lot, you get a lot, definitely, uh, out yeah, of it. Absolutely. Um, I, I do want to go back to the point that I was making about um, execution, because um, I don't want to give the impression that we're, we're, that we're all just about tactics. Um, but unfortunately, we are. Um, tactics are the, are the things that people can really understand and really appreciate because they can see them, touch them, um, read them, watch them. Um, so the, the point that I was trying to make about um, getting execution right all the time is because of that. You know, people people who aren't um, schooled in PR or communication, they don't know what goes on in in order to make a video or or build a, um, a website or write a press release, they, they just see the final product and, and kind of associate us with those final products. Um, so that's why execution is really important because it's the way that those things are seen by our, our organizations and the people that we work with. So, um, But hopefully the other points that I made about measurement and focusing on audiences and outcomes um, uh, sort of demonstrate that, I, that I'm not saying that we just need to be tacticians, it's just we need to be good at delivery. Okay. Um, actually, we do have several questions, uh, but they were not in the chat pane. They were in questions pane, which is okay. I just didn't okay. find them. So, <laughs> first, uh, Christine Payne says, "I like the templates, and thank you for sharing." Uh, okay. How do you align the project-based templates to an overarching internal communication strategy? Um, it can be used for both, actually. Um, so it. They're just as useful for um, sort of components within an internal communication plan, so project by project, for, in, for example. But you can also use it to build um, an, an overarching strategy as well. Um, it depends on how um, deep your strategy is going to go. Um, but the audience framework, um, particularly, is really good at helping you um, think about the people that are going to be most influential. To, to where you want to be at, at the end of, of the strategy, whether that's a one-year or um, you know, a, a time-specific uh, plan, um, and can keep you at the level of, of overall outcomes and, um, and where um, the, the program needs to be at the, en at the end of the, of the time frame. So I would say it can be useful for both. Um, what you might need to do, though, is, is articulate the, the final plan in a, in a different form. I find the, the audience framework is useful to just start organizing thoughts, but you'll probably need to, to transfer that into something that resembles a more traditional communication plan afterwards. I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, so the next question is from Sarah Robinson, and she asks, uh, how important it is for IC to be strategic advisor to the business? Um, my, my own view on that is, is that it's very important, um, but that's coming from an internal communicator, I guess, so you probably wouldn't be surprised to hear me say it. Um, but, but I think it depends on the organization, really. Um, I, think, I think we, the point that I was making about um, organizations not really understanding the kind of contribution that communication can make. Um, it's up to us to show them the difference that, that strategic communication can make to solving real business challenges. Um, and, and if you focus on impacts and if you focus on um, more than just a tactical delivery, you will build your, your credibility and your position as, um, an, as an advisor because you're, you're interested in more than just um, the tactics and, and the things that we do. You're interested in what happens as a result. Um, so I think you know we, we need to be able to advise our organisations on um, how uh, projects and, and campaigns and initiatives and, and decisions that are being taken within the organisations are going to have an impact on our audiences. Um, and so I think it's really important that we play that role because I, I just don't think that organisations otherwise really understand um, the perspective that we bring. Um, thank you. Uh, next question is from Kate Robson, 
and she asks, hi, hi Neil, how honest would you be about talking about those flaws? How have you approached being able to tell people this is no reason for this, etc.? Could you repeat the last part of the, the question? Uh, yeah, I believe it was uh, probably somewhere in the middle uh, of the presentation. Um, how have you approached being able to tell people this is no reason for this, etc.? About talking um, honesty and talking about flaws. Um, well, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's it's never easy. It's it, you know to be the the one the, the thorn in the side of, of of somebody who really just wants to to launch their project. Um, but no, it, it's it's never easy. And I, I mean, I tend to do it um, in a way of that sort of have you considered what would happen if? Um, and that usually works. Um, I mean, there's been some times where people just haven't considered. Who is going to be impacted by, um, excuse me, you know, um, the decision to remove a, a piece of software or introduce a new timekeeping system? There's lots of examples that I can think about, um, and you know, as annoying as it can be for for people to hear that uh, the point that you're trying to make, um, you know, it, it it's not that you're doing it for your own health. That you're making these points, it's really because it's in the interests of the business. So um, I think you're safe to to really um, expose where there are some uh, shortcomings in, in in projects that you're being asked to work on. Um, so it is it is a little bit about being brave and, and being the one to, to be that voice. But um, my experience is that over time, um, and and again, if it's if it's not just about your own personal convictions, and it's actually about the people that are going to be impacted by these decisions. Um, and by these flaws, then you know you, you're safe to to really point them out. Um, and the last one is not really a question; uh, it's more a comment uh, from Kenichi Esomeu. I'm really sorry if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly. Um, I have really enjoyed this webinar. Neil's presentation has been really clear and interesting, and so relevant to what we face, which is, I think, a wonderful way. To end this, uh, which I totally agree with. I'll, I'll take that. Thanks very much. <laughs> uh, thank you, Neil, very much. Uh, thank you, of course, to all attendees, uh, the ones who are uh, looking at this and watching this uh, after it. You're probably watching the recording, uh, which we will send to everybody who attended and also um, to everybody who signed up and didn't attend. And. Uh, Stay tuned, uh, we will be back in February with a new webinar and we will let you know soon uh, what the topic is and who is the speaker. Um, again, uh, as I uh, told you last month, uh, don't forget about Eurocom, uh, our uh, conference that we have in London, IBC Mina is organizing a conference in London uh, at the end of March, so 27th and 28th of March, and if you go to iabcimina.com, uh, you can you can still get the early bird until uh, the end of the month, and I believe we'll have a, a stellar uh, uh, speakers and uh, a stellar lineup um, there. So everybody invited. Neil, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Yasmin. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>